Okay. Um, good afternoon. I think we will start. We have quite a tight agenda, and it's better to start on time. My name is uh, Eric Ochlin. I'm the director of the ILO, the International Labour Organization, the, of the ILO office in, uh, in Egypt, uh, and the decent work team for North Africa. I'm uh, very pleased uh, to welcome you uh, to the event enabling renewable energy workforce and models for financing on the just and equitable energy transition, uh, which is organized by the Global uh, Wind Energy Council, uh, which I would like to thank uh, uh, for the invitation. And uh, it's just an exchange because you participated in a yellow event last week, uh, and then it's, uh, it's a good sign of partnership uh, between uh, uh, your council and the ILO. Uh, I'm pleased also to moderate the session. The ensuring a, a just transition is a crucial enabler of ambitious climate action and an engine of sustainable development. And all actors, government, enterprise, as well as banks, investors, are committed to facilitating a just transition. And the issue of just transition is quite important for us at the ILO. We in 2015, we adopted the guidelines, the ILO guidelines for just transition towards environmentally sustainable economies and societies for all. It's always a long title, but, uh, which is for the member states to, uh, to follow. Today, as you know, it's also a particular day, it's a gender day, and uh, that's why also it's uh, key that we also discuss this, this, this issue in the different panel and in this uh, panel today. Uh, but also we discussed the uh, issue of uh, financing, uh, which is an important one, and uh, uh, because both public and financing are in innovative ways, scale and speed to the significant transformation required in the energy sector. And that's why the ILO and the uh, LSE grant uh, Research Institute publish uh, a tools, uh, which is uh, just uh, financing tools, uh, which is available on our website, also to facilitate uh, the just transition on the financing uh, aspect. But today also we discuss some practical experience, and I'm pleased that we have also the experience from South Africa. Hello. Is it, I hope it is better. Uh, yes, I say that uh, we are so pleased to discuss a concrete example with South Africa and um, the Just Energy Transition uh, Partnership uh, model. Then today we have also very distinguished uh, participants. Um, Mr. Rachel uh, Makewan, Chief Sustainability Officer from the Scottish and Source on Electricity. Uh, Ms. Elbia Ganum, CEO of uh, Abeolica. Uh, Mr. Chris Antonopoulos, uh, CEO of Lekela Power. And uh, Ms. Rabia Firouki, Director of Knowledge Policy and Finance Center of IRENA. Then, uh, and uh, of course, Deepak Patel, uh, who will present the example of, uh, of South Africa. Uh, but before moving to the presentation of uh, on South Africa, I'm very pleased to give the floor to Rachel uh, for some keynote remarks. That's over to you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that introduction, Eric, and thanks to GWEC for inviting me to speak. And I guess I'm here to give a practical example from my small corner of the world in Scotland. And to do that, I'm wearing two hats. Um, the first hat, as Eric explained, is my day job, which is Chief Sustainability Officer of Electricity Utility SSE. But my other hat is that, I, that I've been wearing for four years is that I'm a commissioner on the Scottish Government's Just Transition Commission. And that's where I'm going to start because four years ago, the Scottish Government established a commission at a country level, so not just in terms of the energy sector, 
to consider how to share the benefits of climate action widely, there's loads of benefits, whilst at the same time making sure that the costs are distributed amongst those that are able to bear them. So the Commission consisted of industrialists like me, but trade unionists, environmentalists, even farmers and agricultural workers. And I guess my point I'm trying to make is that you could call it a social dialogue. But if you had been a fly on the wall at the very first evidence gathering session back four years ago and the tension that was in the room, you wouldn't have believed it would be possible to, have received, to achieve consensus by the end. But three years later, that's exactly what we achieved and we did have unanimity across the commissioners. And I think there were two reasons for that. The first was that the goal of net zero and aiming for a 1.5 degree pathway was not negotiable. And the second reason was that every single one of us listened to the other, respecting their position, and most of us had to make some movement on compromise too. And there were core principles that we violently agreed upon, and they were simple. The first was that an unplanned and disorderly transition to net zero has the worst effects on human beings, whether they're Sorry, I hope that's not too painful. <laughs> um, so my, the point I'm making is that the more unplanned a transition is, the worse it is for people, whether it's working people, their communities, or for consumers. But we also agreed that the pursuit of order is no excuse to water down climate commitments. The truth is the most catastrophic injustices arise with the most dangerous climate global warming. Which kind of brings me to my day job. I've been doing a variation of this job for nearly 10 years and in that time, the company I work for, our direct emissions have fallen from 25 million tonnes of carbon dioxide to 5 million tonnes. And I guess you could say that some hard yards of transition have been taken. And the company's effectively transitioned from one, an electricity generator with coal, gas and renewables to one dominated by gas and renewables. We closed our last coal plant three years ago and now our aim is to bring about the responsible phased reduction of unabated gas en route to net zero by 2040 at the very latest. But the only reason that we've got a chance of achieving that is because of our investments and ambitions in renewable energy. We're, I know that there's sort of brag -a -lots when it comes to renewable energy companies and we're no different, but um, we're planning £25 billion of sterling investment into the UK and Ireland and now beginning to look elsewhere too. And it means that our renewables capacity will increase more than threefold and our output from those wind farms will increase fivefold. And the scale of investment in Scotland, which is obviously my, my corner of the world, alongside many of the other investors, means that I sometimes think that Scotland will look like a construction site for the next 10 years, which is all fine and good. But just because renewable companies are exploiting the opportunities of climate change, doesn't mean to say that they don't have a responsibility to mitigate the risks for people associated with the transition. Sorry, I hope that's better. So my point is, is that just because renewables developers get to do the fun bit and the great bit doesn't mean to say that we don't step up to the plate to help those that are coming out of the sunset industries. And in my neck of the woods in Scotland, the juxtaposition of North Sea oil and gas with North Sea offshore wind is a very powerful case in point. There will be an inevitable decline in North Sea oil and gas, affecting its direct workforce and supply chain, amounting to tens of thousands of jobs. But it is possible to be smart and establish pathways for skilled technical people to transition to the low carbon industries of the future. In fact, at SSE we've discovered that oil and gas workers are already voting with their feet 
one in five people working for SSE consider themselves to be former high carbon workers. That's around two and a half thousand people so far, and we want more of them. So, and Giles from Trade Body Wind Europe was supposed to be here today, and he'd hoped to join the panel. So he sent me an email to, uh, insisting that I gave some other examples outside of my own corner of the world. And the first example that he wanted to highlight is about the reskilling of coal miners. One of his Romanian members established an academy to retrain miners to do operations and maintenance on wind farms. And of course, it's, it's functioning with the blessing of the coal mining industry. And in the UK, there are examples of coastal towns benefiting from investments in ports and harbours to service offshore wind. Now, I'm not saying for a second that these good news examples mean that our almighty transition, industrial transition from high carbon activity to low carbon activity is yet a comprehensively fair and just one. There are huge challenges to overcome. But if there's anything that we know about the debates here and elsewhere too, it's all about local context and place. So I do think that the aspect that transcends us all is the fact that fairness and justice for workers and communities is impossible to achieve unless they and their human rights are at the centre of the table. And I suspect that's a very good place to start. Thank you. Scotland is not just a corner, it's one of the most beautiful corners in the world. <laughs> I've been several times. Uh, now I'm pleased to invite uh, Deepak Patel to present the example of uh, South Africa uh, and, uh, with the Just Energy Transition Partnership. You have the floor. Thank, thank you very much, Eric. Um, I'm Deepak Patel. I also am wearing two hats. One is that I'm the head of um, climate finance and innovation at the South African Presidential Climate Commission. And the other hat, until recently, until we unveiled our Just Energy Transition Investment Plan, I was subject, obviously, to a non-disclosure agreement because I was part of the team that was negotiating with the counterparty, which is the International Partners Group made up of five jurisdictions, the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, the EU, and then later joined by the Climate Investment Funds, which I will also talk about because our president launched that um, South African jet investment plan on the Friday prior to COP having started. But I want to start our journey in South Africa similarly to Rachel, and that is um, explain what the genesis at which point did we understand that climate and development were in fact two sides of the same coin? And um, Eric has talked about the ILO Pact on Just Transition. I want to say that in South Africa, it was COSATU, the Congress of South African Trade Unions, who coined the term Just Transition way back in 2010. And as we progressed, that notion of a just transition became embedded in all of the country's approach to social and economic development. So I do want to take us on a journey to explain how we finally got to the mechanics, hopefully the coherent and adequate financing of our just energy transition. So we started the general and come down to the empirical and very hard nuts and bolts um, of projects and finance. Um, we have something called the National Development Plan in South Africa, which emanating from the SDGs, sketched a path for socio-economic development for South Africa, and that is regarded as the cornerstone of the country's approach to socio-economic development. We also have a very well-established compacting process between the social partners, that is statutorily determined in a place called NEDLAC um, and where labor, business, government and more recently joined by civil society compact on critical economic issues. 
at the job summit in 2018, which was convened under the auspices of NEDLAC, but in fact um, patronized by the president, what arose was a clarity of understanding that climate change was upon us, that we needed to respond to it, and that jobs, livelihoods, and well-being of local communities needed to be at the center of that conversation. So it was in 2018 that the idea of a presidential climate commission was born, and it took a year or two to finalize the compacting arrangements leading to the appointment of the commission um, early in 2021. So the presidential climate commission, but seen in the context of the socio-economic journey for South Africa is a relatively recent um, being. We called it a we, we called it a unique creature in the ecosystem of South Africa because we have at the moment no statutory power. However, we have given, given a mandate to advise independently based on the best science and empirical evidence possible, a compact between the social partners for what a just transition in South Africa would look like. The commission is made up of 10 cabinet ministers in the commission. It is made up of 22 other members drawn from a variety of societal groups, including organized labor, youth, um, and the NGO and the environmental sector, business, both of the two big business associations are in it, as well as um, um, other civil society formations, but very importantly, academia and science. And one of our first tests was in fact prior to COP26 last year, when it was time for all countries to either amend or keep their nationally determined contributions the same in the UNFCCC framework. And we took a view at that point in time based on all of the modeling that we had done, based on what business ground up was prepared to say about what their journeys to net zero would look like. Having gotten all of the major trade union federations on sides, with a commitment that there will be justice in this transition, we were able, as the Commission, to recommend to the South African government that we needed to be bolder, more ambitious, but premised on science and rationality in our submission to the UNFCCC. And so the nationally determined contributions that we lodged with the UNFCCC last year prior to before we came to COP, in fact, was quite an interesting expression of an unconditional commitment that we would make with no assistance from outside that would see us being consistent in our fair share contribution to no more than two degrees Celsius rise in temperature. However, there was a second more ambitious trajectory that was more consistent with no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius, where as a developing country, we said, unless the developed world comes to the party, we will not meet this trajectory. And so, in essence, we came to Glasgow last year in a perfect configuration of socially compacted process that had confidence that all of society in South Africa was behind our commitment. Secondly, the developed world has not, had not lived up to its committed um, contribution to Paris. And we were, well, I suppose, the darling child um, of those countries that needed both conditions to be met. Rationality, a clear path, how decarbonization is associated with development, as well as then a ready place to make a pledge. And so what we call the political declaration that was signed last year in Glasgow between South Africa represented by our president and the five uh, jurisdictions predictions represented at that time by their presidents or prime ministers resulted in something called the JET-P, the Just Energy Transition Partnership, with the counterparties being the South African government on the one hand and these five jurisdictions on the other hand. And it has taken us, since the start of the negotiations, the better part of eight months 
to come up with something that resembles both a partnership as well as a path to decarbonize and embed just transition in that framework. That was launched, as I said, two weeks ago. And in essence, it says that South Africa's reality is that um, all of our sectors, whether we talk about social sectors or industrial and mining sectors, are reliant on electricity at this point in time or hydrocarbon-derived petroleum products. And so we have 90% of our electricity generated by a monopoly state-owned utility called ESCOM. And of that 90%, something like 86% is derived from firing coal. Um, last year, when I came to the, um, this, this um, pavilion, actually, and I met Ben for the first time, what we indicated was that even though there was a, a, a hesitation for a number of years in the rollout of renewables, that what we were going to announce was a rapid commitment out renewables and essentially 80% of the 8.5 billion dollars that has been pledged will in fact go to either a decarbonization of the electricity system or it will go into a strengthening of the grid infrastructure associated with that electricity system secondly because we believe that the motor industry in South Africa is so critically strategic for the jobs that it provides, but also the investments we've made over a number of decades to stimulate it as a place of assembly for many drive vehicle um, models that are exported. And thirdly, we believe we have all of the critical natural endowments to be a player both for domestic as well as for global consumption in the hydrogen sector. So the JetP is essentially the early stages, what we would call the spearhead, the leading edge of how we will embark on our decarbonization journey while we ensure that just transition is embedded in them. I want to spend a minute talking about just transition. The coal fields of South Africa are located in a province called Mpumalanga, and 90, 80, 90, 80 to 90% of the coal that is um, burnt in South Africa comes from there. Our power stations are located there, and as Ben will know, the endowment for solar and wind sits elsewhere in the country. Last year, I posited the notion that we needed to find both the sensibility as well as the models that would allow us to crowd in new solar and wind in those areas that are going to be affected as we experience a decline in coal. And I'm very happy to announce that a large number of projects, given that the grid is ready to be connected to as decommissioning takes place for the coal power stations, as well as some contribution made by ESCOM in the, in, the, in, the, in the form of land becoming available means that even though where previously those projects would have been considered unfeasible, it's actually a rush and an enthusiasm to crowd in renewables in those exact spatial locations where we know that coal decline is going to take place. I see a sign and I just want to say that for us in South Africa, we are very excited. 8.5 billion is just a tip of the iceberg. It is not anywhere near the kind of financing and investment we need for a full transition, but it will help to catalyze, and we are readying ourselves now, rather than just to tell a good story, to begin to implement that story. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much for this um, experience and I think in both cases we saw the importance of partnership and uh, as I yellow also the fact that both of you mentioned the importance of uh, social dialogue and uh, that's uh, I think very important that we also discuss with the, the workers representative when we discuss also about just transition and that's uh, a very important point for sure. 
No, I'm pleased to invite the other panelists, uh, Rania, Albia, and Chris, if you want to join the podium. Yes. Okay. Uh, welcome, and uh, now we can start the, the discussion. And um, the first question is mainly addressed uh, to uh, Javier Albi and Rachel. Is uh, we know that there is a gender imbalance both in the wider energy workforce as well as in the renewable energy workforce. What are some of the biggest barriers you have faced from an industry level? in reaching your career uh, goals. You want? First, okay. um, so as a, as a woman that's been in politics, so before I worked in uh, industry, I worked in politics uh, for nearly 30 years. I've kind of had this question a number of times and, um, and actually in 2022, I want to have a glass half full and I suppose 30 years of experience is that I've seen how things have changed and I have never felt more hopeful for the young women in the room than uh, at any time uh, in, in my career. And things like it is socially unacceptable to have an all-male panel. Um, so there might be the odd one that still slips through the net, but it's pretty much not okay anymore. That our boards are you know, increasingly getting towards... Uh, you know, 30, 40, 50 percent uh, female. So I think um, still a long way to go, but I actually think for the young women that are in the room, your, your future looks good. Thanks, uh, thanks, Gilek, for your invitation. Thanks for this panel. This subject is very important for us. Thanks for to be uh, gender inclusive in this panel. Yes, 50-50, this is very nice. So I have uh, several, several hats here. Yes, I'm CEO uh, of the Brazil Indian Power Association, Vice Chair in GWEC, Global Indian Energy Council. And uh, lately I have been so engaged in, in uh, gender equality subject in Brazil. We have uh, some uh, groups that work together. My friend Fernanda Delgado is here uh, with me. She works in uh, oil gas sector. We work together in Singulars Existing. This is a group that you put a, a, a host list with a women that is able to go uh, important uh, responsibility uh, in energy sector, uh, sea level in general. Uh, we have uh, Mulheres, uh, Mulheres de Energia uh, and this group that we work together and we have a mentor uh, uh, discussions and I'm an ambassador in Women in India in the, the GWAC program and I'm so engaged in diversity inclusion and the, uh, social inclusion. We you know that Brazil is a very rich when we talk about sources for energy uh, electricity, uh, we have uh, renewable a lot, we have uh, some uh, uh, fossil oil gas uh, a lot to, to run, uh, but we need to manage this. Actually, our situation is, uh, is about not scarcity, it's about abundance, we have a lot. But uh, in other hand, uh, we know that Brazil has a very, very uh, uh, large social gap. Actually, now we, we had the uh, elections, we have a new president in the next year. It will be a big, big challenge for president because Brazil is a very bad situation when you talk about uh, social in general. It's not uh, about gender equality and the other subjects. Then uh, in this uh, uh, issue, this is energy transition and uh, just uh, energy transition we have a lot to do, and we have a lot to learn with other countries, uh, uh, with other experiences. But uh, I, 
I'm a little optimistic about this because in the last three or four years, the ESG agenda is uh, very strong in Brazil. We see our companies working in order to promote uh, diversity, inclusion. We see our energy companies with programmers. Then I believe that uh, right now we need a better pro position from the government. Uh, when you talk about to finance energy transition and uh, looking for Brazil, maybe our problem is not about to have financing, but it's how to attract money, uh, investors. Then we, have a, 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 we are able to do this because we have a very good regulator from work. Now we are, we are working in order to prepare regulator from work for offshore wind. But Brazil has a very established regulator from work. It's a very attractive country, has a lot of sources. But I think we need a, a strong position from the government. Government needs to give a good sign for market, for investors, and the, uh, to be a little bit more uh, engaged in process for attracting investments and engaging in this subject, diversity, inclusion, and the, uh, the main point is about the social inclusion. When we talk about wind specifically, uh, we launched a report six months ago. It's very interesting. In the region that we made investments for wind, we could in, uh, increase GDP in 20%. In the Northwest, I can see my friend in here, Jurandir Picasso from Ceará, Joaquim. We work together. And the uh, Northeast region increasing GDP 20% and the um, index for human uh, development increasing 21%. Each one dollar that we invest in the uh, wind sector, we can increase it 2.9 dollars for GDP. This is number is uh, fantastic. This number is fantastic. If the government make a good position, give a good sign for investors, uh, investments, finance, it's not a problem. Our company wants to work in order to inclusion. And the, I think uh, our situation is not good right now, but I believe, like you, that we have a, a very good future about this subject. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Javier, your turn. Thank you. Um, so when I started a few decades ago, uh, I was very one of the very few in uh, energy. I started at my working at OPEC, sorry, but at the time renewables were not really in. And I must say that uh, more often than not, we were very few in meetings with men. And uh, even uh, if we were in meetings with men, then usually they would think that, you know, we're the secretary or we should book a taxi or something like that. So I agree that things have changed. Um, and um, And I think they've changed also because women get more attracted to renewables and to re energy transition related jobs I mean a cleaner world etc I think that makes a difference but at ARENA we have started the only series that exists on a gender perspective in renewable energy to see approximately how many women work in the field so what we find from a global study we did in 2019 is that 32% of women uh, are in the renewable energy sector. This is much better than the conventional sector at 22%, but sorry to say 21% for wind, which we did with GWEC, so not very good for wind. And we just launched a few weeks ago our third survey, which is on the solar PV, and that's much better. It's at 40%. Um, I was holding my breath because we needed the, a big number to, you know, to make sure that the average of 32% still makes sense. Um, and in those surveys, we ask what are the barriers that women face, the challenges, the opportunities, and of course, we provide recommendations and provide lots of examples and case studies of you know, best practices like you have mentioned. 
And actually, the most important barrier are social and cultural norms, which really uh, determine a lot of the decisions that we make in the, in the labor market. And uh, for that, I mean, there's a lot of work still to be done. And that's across geographies, interestingly enough. I mean, you know, we're talking about this panel being, uh, you know, equitable, let's say. But most panels, a lot of the time, there are panels where I refuse to go because I'm the only woman. So obviously you can tell me, yeah, then there's no women at all. But, you know, we need to push a lot harder and the mansplaining, et cetera, et cetera. Now, personally, I think women, it, throughout my career, I had to work a lot harder than men. Um, the glass ceiling is a reality. It still is a reality. And uh, to get you know, up there at the management level or at decision-making level, we're very few women. And so that's what we find in our surveys. There's a lot of women in administration, which is fine, but you know, the minute you go into STEM fields or you go into you know, uh, yeah, occupations that require some education, I mean, there is definitely a great imbalance uh, right there. I'm just going to finish by saying that at Arena, we started 10 years ago um, with a, a, an econometric model that looks, uh, that translates energy transitions, uh, so globally, regionally, nationally. We're doing one for South Africa and Egypt right now, where we translate the, the trajectory, if you will, of the 1.5 in, from energy into socioeconomic variables. So that's GDP, that's uh, jobs. Uh, at the economy level, in the energy sector, and then in energy transition-related jobs, and then in well-being, because GDP really hides a lot of the disparity that you have in society. Even our global numbers, I mean, I can give you very positive numbers in terms of GDP and in terms of jobs globally, but the minute you go into the detail of regional and national outcomes, then the story looks quite different depending on the, uh, the context of the country, be it the economy, the society, the, stru the, the, the structures that exist, the dependencies that we have in, uh, in, uh, in, in developing countries uh, in terms of commodities, etc. So this is uh, just maybe, I also, I feel that uh, I'm focal point at Irina on gender, and uh, I'm, I think there is a much brighter future for young uh, women, but we have still a lot of work to be done. Thank you. I think there's a mix between optimism, but uh, a lot of challenges and a lot of things to do, and I would say together, and that's maybe also how we can work together on that. And if you have a project in Egypt, well, let's see if we can work together. <laughs> Uh, now that's lead to my, to my second question is how can the private sector encourage the diversity, equity and inclusion in the energy sector, in the, in the workforce? I mean, can you hear me? Oh yes, you can, of course. So good afternoon everyone. I'm Chris Antonopoulos, CEO of Lekela Power. If you don't know us, we are focusing only on Africa and renewable power only, not outside of Africa. And we are existing only for seven years, but we are already now the largest pure play renewable energy company in Africa. Now, I was very interested to hear what was discussed today and um, you know, think about the percentage of women not only in the administrative jobs, but overall. Well, look at our website. What you will see is actually five of my new, uh, five of my nine board members are actually females. So the majority is female. That means it actually works. Nothing to do with social things, etc. If it's it, 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 at the end of the day, it's a determination by the company, and that's where it starts. You know, at the at the top. You know, do you have a strategy? to actually bring women into your company, yay or nay? You know, do you have an HR strategy which, follow, which, which really follows diversity and equity, yay or nay? And that was what we have done some years back. Um, 
where we looked at, um, at gender and did a gender assessment to see where do we stand. And we are, by the way, above the 32%. <laughs> we have more women there than 32%, but hopefully that is helped by being in a renewable energy field. Um, but still, that's not the end of it. You know, we think that we should be equitable. We should be, you know, up to 50% at least. But the more important item is also, you know, being paid at the same for providing the same work. One thing is just the numbers, whether you have, you know, 30 or 40%. The other thing is, are, are your women, are your females getting paid the same stuff, yay or nay? And I think this is where we have a bigger issue, to be very honest. And I'm, of course, I'm support, supportive of governments doing a lot of things, but I think at the end of the day, it's up to, you know, local, you know, private companies to actually do the, the step. Don't wait for the governments to tell you what you do. You can do it yourself. And um, it takes a little bit more time. Uh, you know, for instance, just give you an example. To get there, we do a lot of mentorships. And myself, even the CEO of the company, I'm mentoring women in my organization. So I take time to make sure that, you know, they understand what I'm doing and what it takes to, to be a leader, a female leader in an in a international company like, like us. So that's, that's absolutely critical. And in each country that we go, we also do... Um, programs. So for instance, here we have just, um, by the way, we are, we have here the largest um, wind project that is operational in, in, um, in Egypt, 250 megawatts. And obviously that's the first of many to come. But um, we have also um, here realized that, it, uh, particularly if you're in uh, rural areas, and the wind projects are in rural areas, it's more difficult to bring the women in. So we have now launched a uh, new program, which is called, you know, Women in Renewable Energy Network, which, where we're working together with EETC, the utility here, in order to attract more, more women. By the way, EETC is a fantastic example of you have many, many women working actually for there. And the decision makers in ETC are actually females, uh, which is fantastic, fantastic to see. So we are pushing very, very hard on this. We're doing also in, um, in South Africa with another program I will talk probably later about this, which is Inspire, which is, you know, where we're trying to, to bring in knowledge, technical knowledge into the country and particularly also you know, attractive, attractive female participation in that. We'll talk about this a little later. May, may, may I just add, um, in, our, in our country's case, because the coal fields and the coal-fired power stations are located in such a close spatial proximity, you can imagine that unemployment rates between men and women firstly are skewed. So I'm going to spend just a minute talking about the deep inequality that exists in our society and what the transition offers as a potential to alter that balance. So a move away from coal means that there are more decent, cleaner, let's just say jobs that are no longer um, requiring of the traditional male type of worker. Secondly, as those jobs get negatively impacted, we have to create value chains and alternative livelihoods. And what's becoming very clear is that with youth unemployment at the rate that it is, the renewable higher skilled opportunities that come give us a chance both for young men and for young women to move into a better, more decent jobs future. But secondly, as we look at issues like rehabilitation of um, old coal mining land, it starts offering us the opportunity to ensure that we become much more gender conscious about the way in which we create new livelihoods. And so we are very much alive to the issue of gender imbalance, just given the sheer history of what coal mining looked like and ensure that we do not replicate that imbalance as we move into a renewables-rich future. 
Thank you. Rachel, you want to say, uh, Elvia? I suppose I want to call out a, a tension and a trade-off, which is in the context of the example I gave earlier of offshore oil and gas um, in the North Sea. Uh, there is a social objective, which is to attract those workers into the renewable industry so that they have got a transition. But of course, the gender makeup of offshore oil and gas workers is, uh, is woeful and much, much worse than renewables. So it's one of these brilliant examples where there is a proper trade off. It's a really hard set of decisions. And um, actually, we need to do both. So yes, we do give those guys jobs. Of course we do. And yes, that may have an impact on our gender statistics. But what you do is you make sure that the pipeline of the, the younger ones that are coming through in apprentices and graduates um, are, are a much, much better mix. And, and certainly with our graduates, we're now at 50, over 50% uh, female. But we will be attracting a lot of guys as well. So it's going to be a long time before we get to parity. Um, uh, okay, uh, it's very interesting uh, when you see your experience about uh, uh, wind, because uh, as I said, we we discuss we started to discuss in Brazil some years ago. Sinhalas uh, exist. What the first list was in 2018 when we had the uh, the election. And the other initiatives like uh, Mulheres de Energia and the other programs that companies start is start in 2020. I launched with the other two uh, friends, uh, Energia da Transformação, it's a uh, in, in very important platform that wants to create programs for uh, job and training. Because uh, the companies that are my members, uh, in general, they, they ask me, Elbe, I want to start with a gender problem here, but I went to, to market it, and I didn't, I didn't find this kind of professional. Then we have a very interesting case there. Uh, the company is e EIS, that EIS wanted to install a new, a new site, a new wind farm, and they decided to contract a women for operation. Because it's very important, because sometimes we, dis we discuss engaging women and they create opportunity in sea level. But it's very important to create in, in basic level. Then uh, when this company started this program, we didn't have this kind of professional. But what we did? We prepare them. We create a program to train them. We train this, uh, these women. Uh, uh, we needed about uh, 25, but to train 50 women, then we put the other in the markets. And then after other companies uh, uh, saw that the program and start other programs, and then now we have uh, three or four companies now with uh, new sites and the, uh, putting uh, women in operation. Then it's very, very interesting. And uh, as, uh, we are discussing uh, the, the, the most part of it, our job here will be for the next generation. We will be in good situation, maybe in the next uh, generation. But it's very good to, to see right now some results like this. I know this is, is a, a very small part but this kind of initiative can help other companies and can give a, a good sign. And the uh, very positive point, in my opinion, as a woman that I in, in energy sector for 20 years, uh, is now we can talk about this. We have a place to say. Before, five years ago, six years ago, no, it's not. Uh, subject. It's me, me, me subject. But now, no, we can't talk about this. We have a because uh, numbers. It's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. And that's in, as in continuation of the issue. Uh, the next question will be more what you would like to see in terms of policy uh, to help accelerate and assist the movement of workers from the carbon intensive energy industries to the renewable energy industry in terms of finance, incentive, support. And maybe I can start with Rabia. Thank you so much. Uh, so, 
Um, we've been pushing for a, a sort of what we call a broader or holistic, I don't like the word, it's overused, a policy framework to accompany the energy transition. I mean, obviously, deployment policies are really important and uh, they come sort of first, but they should be accompanied with uh, labor market policies, social policies, etc. And that's the only way that we can make that transition just, quote unquote, because we also need to define what just really means. So if renewables have done a lot of progress, I think where we're lagging behind quite a bit is on skills, training, and education. And um, that needs, the pace needs to change. Uh, and of course, people from industry know better than me that there are skills gaps right now. And um, we have also worked quite a bit over the past few years on looking at the segments of the value chains in renewables and looking at the occupational profile along the segments of the value chain. So uh, I know there are, I mean, they're not necessarily better jobs because it's renewables. Uh, so we have to be careful there. So uh, we have found, for example, that in solar PV, 60% of the jobs are low skilled labor. So how do you ensure that those jobs are going to be decent jobs, for example? So that's another question that we have to cut. It's not just because it's renewable that it's going to be better. It's cleaner, yes, sure. Uh, but it's not necessarily better just because it's renewables. We have also looked at IPPs in uh, developing countries, uh, South Africa is one of them, uh, and we have looked at the impact of communities. And you know, it's we know that whether it's renewables or any other energy uh, uh, energy source, we know that infrastructure projects bring with it, you know, some negative impacts. Uh, we cannot just say because it's renewables, then it's going to be better than others. No, we have to be just just as careful as with any other infrastructure projects about the, you know, the kind of jobs that it brings. So PV is one of them with 60% of low-skilled labor, but there are very interesting synergies. I mean, we've seen synergies with coal, for example. Uh, we have, uh, uh, there was an interesting study about uh, the synergies between coal and uh, solar PV, where about 43% of coal-fired plant workers could be transitioned to the PV industry without any training. Um, so, and again, uh, a lot of those, uh, those, those skills are, uh, or those jobs are low-skilled jobs. There are other interesting also um, uh, um, experiences with the, the creation of transition uh, training funds. Uh, for example, in the state of Colorado, there is a bill that was passed, $15 million, uh, to provide assistance to coal-dependent workers. Half of it is for training. And there's an other examples in Scotland, etc. But so, again, uh, it's not because, just that I say that it's not because you're putting renewable energies and energy efficiency measures that you're going to have development. I mean, you have to link it to, to, to specific activities. Uh, the same way, it's not because you're having renewables that you're going to have a just transition from the kind of jobs that you, you, you are creating. Um, uh, the, 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 the most important thing is that holistic framework that I started speaking about, which needs to accompany the energy transition to ensure that that transition is going to be just. Thank you on this uh, question. So we don't have a lot of time, but you want to add some points? I uh, fully agree with what you said. I think training is really the one thing that, that uh, the governments can help us with to, to reskill, to upskill the, the people into renewable power in order to have this transition and to have it in a ju just fashion. But at the same time, I believe we cannot just depend 100% on what you know governments may do or may not do. I think there is also an obligation on us, I'm talking now about the private companies, to do something similar. And I mentioned to you before that we have, for instance, a program in South Africa called Inspire. This is, um, we have created uh, more than a year back a center of excellence for social performance. Just to give you in brackets what it is all about, 
you probably are aware that, that uh, South Africa has one of the most advanced programs and requirements to privates when it comes to economic development, socioeconomic development, and this is really great, by the way. But uh, there are uh, two shortcomings from my perspective. The one is, you know, these specialists that are supposed to implement the economic development programs or socioeconomic development programs, where do they get the skills from? It's not clear. It's not there. So we, we uh, have... Um, have um, then um, decided that we will put the center of excellence in place it's to, to, and we have it now in place to 221 so in order for actually people all these uh, practitioners to come to to this center of excellence and get just the latest on what's happening number one to have also a place where we get all the information together on what each of these ipps are doing with respect to economic and socioeconomic de development and also, of course, to help the different IPPs working together in order, you know, if, if there are good projects around so that they can work together to, to leverage uh, the impact for, uh, for a specific case. So, as a matter of fact, quite a lot of people told us this is fantastic what you're doing there. And we started this and now we have more and more people joining, joining this crowd. So, that means privates need to be participating in that as well if this should become a, a true success. Thank you. Okay, um, so I'll be a little bit controversial. It, in terms of my own market, I don't think there's a problem with policy. What I think is that there's a problem with leadership. So, um, you know, it doesn't take a genius to work out that the skills frameworks for energy should be uh, common. A, a whole high voltage engineer offshore, high voltage in nuclear, high voltage in transmission is roughly the same and that we should be able to create frameworks. Everybody agrees with that. The issue is, is a lack of really serious workforce planning and I guess I, I do think that p political leaders have got a job to do there to stand up to, to plan this out. I mean, I mentioned earlier that Scotland's going to be a building site for 10 years and we're in danger of not meeting target, net zero targets because we're not able to deploy quickly enough. So my own view is a slightly different aspect, which is the skills agenda. It's not hard to fix that. We should just do it. Thank you. You want to say a few words or we move to the question from the room? Uh, we have only, I think, two minutes. <laughs> uh, but is there any question from, uh, from your side? Or comments? Yes. Hi, thank you for a very interesting discussion. I'm Agata Motskuta from University of Hull in England. So my question is, what do you think the role of academia is in filling the skills gap? Thank you, and there is one question. One question from, uh, from uh, thank you all for your comments. I um, thought it was a great panel. Uh, I'm curious to hear about how you incorporate other aspects of diversity in it addition to gender diversity, particularly uh, ethnic and racial diversity, into your conception of a just transition and, and you know, ensuring that the economic benefits of the clean energy transition helps those parts of the population that often get left behind. Thank you. Um, very, very quickly, the role of academia and um, science um, we see as absolutely critical and central to ensure that what we have is empirically based um, guidance to pathways that we want to choose. Secondly, the role of academia in ensuring that we have the skills profile that is required as we move into higher order job requirements as we move into the renewable sector, absolutely critical. I suppose academia also comes politically um, neutral and therefore the role of academia Sure, that regardless of which political party might be in power, is to political proof, so to speak, transition as we move along. It would be it would be really problematic if we found that a transitional plan that looks to 2050 is altered every five years. You can imagine what happens. Thank you. 
Someone would also to respond to the second question and to... I can... To be frank with you, we don't. So it's a, a sort of an afterthought for the moment um, where you have gender and other marginalized communities. Um, then th th we do have some other work where we look at when we, I, I was saying about the impact of IPPs on communities, there we, we do directly ask questions about you know, racial or sexual or whatever diversity. Uh, but gender is high on the agenda and the others are really low on the agenda for the moment. Thank you. The last comment from Rachelo. Uh, uh, about the communities is, uh, uh, or experiencing very, is, is very interesting, uh, as I said, because uh, uh, may, mainly because the community in the northeast of Brazil is a region that uh, in general develop and humanizes uh, Chulao. And the, with your uh, investments, then we can include uh, because uh, families can receive, uh, um, how can I say, is a, a, a rent, and it includes a lot. And the big family uh, children go to school, they they uh, acquire a new houses, new uh, uh, conditions to live better. Then we have a very interesting experience with communities in, in these aspects, is a positive aspect. And recently we started to listen about the potential negative aspects that we are working hard. I personally I work with my friend from uh, Instituto Clima e Sociedade about this too. It's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, I think now I have to end the discussion because we have to stop at, uh, at uh, three. Uh, thank you, I would like to thank all the panelists and I would like to thank uh, also the GWEC for the organization of this panel. Thank you.